So this is Matt Carello. He's with Blockstream, uh, co-founder of Blockstream, and he's talking about economic incentive-based consensus. Good. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Hi. I hope everyone can hear me. I try to project. People in the back, good? All right. Awesome. So, uh, I, as mentioned, I'm Matt. Um, I work for Blockstream. I'm a co-founder there. I've been doing Bitcoin Core development and Bitcoin J stuff for four, five years now, something like that. Um, and I really got into Bitcoin because it was kind of this uh, merging of my interest in both this like economic and kind of almost macroeconomic incentive structures, uh, which is kind of macroeconomics, right? Uh, but also computer science and programming and distributed systems, which is really interesting. Uh, so this talk largely focuses on how these incentive structures work in Bitcoin, uh, briefly touches some alternative systems, and yeah. Um, so, it is going to get a tiny bit technical, hopefully not too technical. Uh, let's start off with, uh, how many people in this room think that they know how consensus works in Bitcoin? Think they know what consensus is in Bitcoin, how it works, if they're comfortable with the security assumptions in it? No idea. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully I can answer a few, can teach a few things, um, but we'll see. Um, so yeah, there is, for those who are done much computer science study are familiar that there is a long history of distributed consensus in computer science. And first of all, I want to start by saying that it is a very different type of distributed consensus in computer science. Uh, kind of for two really important reasons and some other reasons. But mostly because, one, um, uh, the traditional distributed consensus model that you see in computer science is I have 3,000 servers in a data center and I don't want to rely on any one or all of them being online all the time because half of them fail every day and like that's normal. Um, and I still want to be able to like access my database and my database should be consistent and it shouldn't fall over and like I shouldn't lose data arbitrarily and I should be able to form some kind of uh, shared opinion. All the computers should be able to work together and uh, come up with an answer together uh, as to what the status of the database is, what order they should run updates, what order they should reboot, whatever it is, whatever problem it is you want all the computers to have the same answer to some question, uh, you want to, yeah, you want to use some distributed consensus mechanism. In Bitcoin, the answer to the question, the question is, uh, in what order did, did these transactions happen, and thus, what's a double spend? or what is the canonical transaction that is confirmed, what is a double spend. Um, but the traditional distributed, distributed consensus mechanism that you see that is, you know, I have however many servers, really focuses on, uh, we have pre-enrolled servers, so we have, um, we start with 5,000 servers, we know the 5,000 servers, we can list the 5,000 servers, all the 5,000 servers know each other, we know the IP block, their IP addresses for all of them, Bitcoin does not have this at all, obviously, right? Nodes come up and go down all the time. I open my wallet on my phone and I've got a new node that's now a member of this distributed consensus. And then I close it and now it's not a member of the distributed consensus. Um, yeah, so we, we really don't have this concept of enrollment, which has been the focus of academic distributed consensus for a long time. Um, and the second important point, which is kind of related is that academic distributed consensus or traditional distributed consensus has this con is generally does not concern itself with um, well what happens if someone comes along after the fact and wants to figure out what the consensus was right so these 5,000 servers they came up with a consensus and they decided that the database's contents are this and now someone else comes along and half of these servers have failed and, and new ones have come along and whatever and they want to figure out what the consensus was and they want to have some kind of auditability, they want to have some kind of proof that this is what the consensus that these original 5,000 picked was. And that's generally not something that is particularly 
important in kind of a traditional academic study of distributed consensus, but it's critical for Bitcoin, right? Uh, I can still open up my Bitcoin core node and figure out what the consensus was back when Satoshi was the only miner. Um, so yeah, so Bitcoin works in a very different way, obviously, and instead of relying on enrollment, it relies on uh, two things. So first is Hashcash. So it relies on Hashcash to create an identity list, decentralized global rate limit. That is complicated and confusing. Um, so Bitcoin obviously does not rely on identity for mining. You don't have to go register your IP address. It's not on a list, whatever. Um, so it's just, you plug in a machine that has an ASIC or had a CPU back in Satoshi's days, and you just start mining. And importantly, we use the, the Hashcash algorithm, which is the algorithm that all these ASICs are working on when they're mining Bitcoin. They're just spinning and spinning until they find a solution that happens to meet some target in the uh, hash function. And by uh, making it difficult to do Hashcash, we can come up with some global rate limit. So there is a global rate limit. On average, we get ten, uh, one block every 10 minutes. And that is enforced by the system, and that's practically mathematically enforced. Like, you can't, uh, if you plug in a bunch of new ASICs, yeah, maybe the network will speed up for a minute, but then we'll be back to 10 minutes on average, or uh, 10 minutes on average per block. Or if you unplug a bunch of ASICs, yeah, it'll slow down for a bit, but then we'll be back to 10 minutes on average per block. And the, the whole system is rate limited. Um, so that's not enough to create consensus. So let's say we have a blockchain that looks like this. Right? What encourages miners to build block A and not block B? Right? If half the miners were building A and half the miners were building B, then it would be incredibly difficult for anyone who's a member of the network, BitPay, Coinbase, whoever, to look at this and say, well, crap, I have a transaction that's in this block, and I have a transaction that's in this block, but which one should I listen to? Because they conflict, and it's really not clear <coughs> whether B is going to get built and then maybe a C is going to get built that builds on B and then like all of a sudden the transaction that looked like it was ahead, it's no longer the consensus and now I've gotten double spent. Right? So if we have a picture like this, we absolutely need to have miners building block A and continuing the longer fork so that everyone can look at this and say, okay, this fork is longer, we know that this is probably gonna be where we go long term and we can trust that even though we have these random blocks out here, they don't actually matter. So Bitcoin does this uh, for kind of two ways that go hand in hand. So there is an opportunity cost to building B. If you are a miner and you focus here and you build this B block that's actually not gonna end up in the consensus, you've just spent a bunch of power, and you would have otherwise gotten some freshly minted Bitcoins by mining A, right? You would have gotten the transaction fees and the mining subsidy, the, the block reward for the miners. And if you built A, you would have gotten that. But if you build B, and then the rest of the network is honest and goes on and build A and builds out on here, then you don't get anything. Your hopes. Uh, so there's a very strong opportunity cost in the form of 25 bitcoins or however many bitcoins to not building B. So you, you really want to build the thing that is going to be a part of the consensus in the future. And in addition to that, it's also important that there's a direct cost, right? So that it's not free to go off and build B. Otherwise, you know, I would just be blindly attacking Bitcoin because whatever, it's for the walls, right? I just want to break things. Um, but there's a very direct power cost to building B, right? I have to go pay $3,000 a month in power in ASICs to build any block in Bitcoin. So not only am I going to spend a bunch of money to attack the system, but I'm not going to get anything in return because my block's just going to be orphaned and whatever, which sucks. So the security of model of Bitcoin really is that we have a is that it is, for an individual, if you're not colluding with 50% of the mining power, it is rational for you to build on A because there's an opportunity cost to not doing so and it costs you money to not do so. So very directly, uh, as long as we don't have 50% mining pools or a lot of collusion in the network, 
it is uh, economically or game theoretically rational for individuals to be building on the best network and to quote unquote encourage consensus, which is to say encourage, uh, continue building on the chain that will uh, give them the best chance at consensus, which is the longest one. Um, so it's also important to note, you know, there's a lot of other systems around. Uh, you hear about a lot of different things that are proposed as alternatives to Bitcoin that work in very different ways uh, or fairly similar ways. Um, but though Bitcoin relies on the majority not colluding and then there's otherwise uh, rational actions of individuals will build consensus, many of the others are not at all the same. So you have a lot of different models in this space that people are proposing and frankly not a lot of discussion about what the different security models are, right? It's perfectly legitimate to go trust Wells Fargo and FDIC with your money. I do it all the time. It's a perfectly legitimate trust model. It's just not the one we have in Bitcoin. The one we have in Bitcoin is a very, uh, a very careful trust model where you don't have to trust anyone except for a few small facts of like the majority is not colluding, which is a pretty big leap of faith, but it's, uh, it's not just blindly trust one individual. Um, and so we have things like it's the Stellar Ripple model, which is we're trusting some group of nodes who are providing consensus. Uh, and Stellar, I think that's currently one uh, <laughs> node. <laughs> Sorry, Stellar, if there's anyone from Stellar here. I know they're working on it. They're, they're replacing that. They're replacing that. Um, and, you know, the, the proof of stake stuff uh, tries to rely on trusting an economic majority, so it trusts the, whoever holds 50% of the coins or whatever, and it tries to trust them uh, with your consensus and with the ability to double spend and the ability to kind of attack the network and uh, make it fall apart. Um, it's important in these two models to note that it's not necessarily rational for an individual, for the people who are running consensus to build consensus and not fork the network or split the network or whatever because there is a there's money to be made if you attack the network sometimes right if you double spend you can make money if you uh, even in a bitcoin model uh, even in a bitcoin model if you can attack the network and build out this fork and this fork dies you can potentially get just more block rewards right you don't even have to double spend to necessarily make money by attacking this kind of network so in all of these systems, it's important to think about, uh, is it even right, like, in, is the person I'm trusting with consensus and with my money and with this system, do they even have to act irrationally to attack the system? Uh, in the kind of economic, game theoretic sense of rationality of like optimizing for profits. Um, yeah, so anyway, so that, the, the Bitcoin model we can get a bit into kind of uh, stuff we build on top of Bitcoin, uh, and I'm focusing on the Bitcoin model because the others largely are nowhere near as trustless as Bitcoin is. Um, there just hasn't been really any proposals that have the same security model uh, in a lot of ways, and by far most of them are a much more trusting security model of trusting a different group or trusting a larger group. Um, so in any system that is kind of Bitcoin style, where you have a blockchain and you're doing whatever you want with it, um, you still need these two things that we had in Bitcoin. Remember, we had this hash cache, which was creating our decentralized rate limiting, that you have a global rate limiting of the number of blocks, which is kind of required for speed of light and basic physical reasons. Uh, and then we also have this cost of attacking the network and a uh, cost of attacking consensus or building against consensus uh, in the form of this opportunity and a direct cost to doing so. So in a system where we're building a blockchain for you know, whatever purpose, we still have to provide very similar things if we want to use a similar uh, Bitcoin style model where we still have to have this decentralized rate limiting. Now that one, it, it's pretty easy to get that, right? We can get a decentralized rate limiting by doing a kind of merged mining scheme, which is where you can put your mining power in to both Bitcoin and a separate blockchain with no additional overhead, no additional cost for you. Um, this is what Namecoin does. This is what uh, I think Dogecoin does that now too. There's a bunch of systems that do this. Um, but the cost to attack part is much harder, right? So if you're spinning up 
a blockchain and your goal is to use it for, I don't know, you want to put a blockchain in a blockchain, because why not, right? Um, then you have to somehow create an incentive, you have to create an incentive that could be by paying miners directly the same way Bitcoin does, or by, you could do like a name coin kind of system where, oh, you know, you want to use the system to purchase your domain name, you want to use the system to purchase whatever namespace you have, um, uh, those, mine, those fees go to securing the network. They go to securing your system by creating this cost to attacking the network. Um, and it's also important to know that this is the same exact same problem with sidechains, right? Sidechains aren't magic, they're just another blockchain that happens to have a transfer mechanism between Bitcoin and the sidechain so that you can use the Bitcoin token on the sidechain, but you still have to provide this same incentive structure. You still have to be able to incentivize miners to not actively attack your sidechain. Um, yeah. So, you know, you can incentivize by whatever you want, whether it's directly by money or you know, be creative. You can send them hand-drawn pictures of cats if they happen to mine blocks that are part of the chain. Be creative, right? If it incentivizes people, then it incentivizes people. But, yeah. So anyway. <laughs> Do we have questions? There's no way anyone understood my ramblings. Like, I didn't even understand it. I mean, come on. Sure. So, occasionally, Ghash has 51% of the hashing power in Bitcoin. So, how are we not trusting them? Or well, we just trust them. We uh, trust them to follow them. We largely are. Uh, it falls to a kind of similar trust model that you have in a lot of other coins that you see. Like proof of which is uh, it's not as bad as proof of stake, uh, but it's still as bad as some other systems, which is largely that you are uh, trusting that they don't want to destroy the value of the coin, right? If they, if they actively attack the coin, they don't necessarily need to double spend, but they are, it is going to be visible that they're actively forking the network, and potentially that has a very negative impact on the value of Bitcoin. Um, so... Yeah, it's not as severe as like trusting the history of all owners of coins, but you are still trusting that these uh, that Ghash, who has you know a large investment in Bitcoin Asics, doesn't want to destroy the value of both their investment and the uh, coin. But yeah, it, it is kind of a failure of the Bitcoin trust model. Uh, hopefully, it plays out better in the future, but who knows? None of these systems are great anyway. Um, I'm curious about whether you have opinions on the zero coin zero cash uh, proposal that's been floated, and I don't know myself, but does it have a different um, sort of enforcement method or incentive structure than the main Bitcoin one does? No, actually, it's fairly similar in terms of the incentive structures. Um, zero coin for for those who aren't familiar, zero coin and zero cash are two fairly closely related proposals. Uh, zero coin was an earlier one that was fairly computationally expensive and doesn't scale particularly well. Uh, zero cash also doesn't scale hugely well, but it's much better. Um, it does, however, require, I think the, the biggest difference in terms of the incentive structures in it is really the, um, the trusted setup phase. So zero cash, zero coins not, but zero cash requires uh, a trusted setup, which is where you have some uh, group of people all perform this, uh, this operation where the result is a public-private key pair, and then they publish the public key, and you have to trust that they all throw away the, pri uh, the private keys. Uh, if they don't throw away the private keys, or you have to trust that at least one of the set of people threw away the private key. Um, if they don't, then they can all get together and uh, print money without you being able to identify it, and uh, yeah, they, they can just print money and you won't even, you can't know this. It's impossible to tell. So it's kind of... Different trust model, but cool tech. So help us understand the side chains since you're obviously one of your questions. I'm not trying. <laughs> I mean, are all these hundreds of coins that you would expect to come out of these side chains based on the old mining networks where it's all proof of work? I mean, I read your paper. Mm -hmm. It all sounds wonderful, but help us understand some of the mechanics and where, 
come mining and it's going to either be an enabler or an inhibitor or just all it fits in with all these side chains and coins and side chains? Yeah, so I mean, side chains, really, it's important to, to understand that side chains aren't any different in terms of like the incentive structures and stuff that Bitcoin, the Bitcoin, right? You still have to have the same mining, uh, the same mining systems, the same uh, uh, incentive structures as Bitcoin. Uh, the mining systems, of course, you can do a merge mining, which essentially the difference to a miner is like, okay, you plug in one more Raspberry Pi in your farm of a million ASICs, and that adds mining for whatever side chain. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I guess I'm not entirely clear on the question, but like the, the merge mining stuff, yeah, that's that's pretty easy to deal with the mining part, right? You merge mine, and then you still have to have an incentive uh, for people to not have to actively attack the network, right? Because with merge mining, uh, it becomes free to attack the network because you're already mining Bitcoin. Um, so you have to have the same kind of, whether it's a block reward system by taking fees, or whether it's like a name coin kind of system where you're buying domain names and uh, as a part of buying the domain name, you're like paying into the security of the network. Or, you know, whether I'm sitting there hand drawing pictures of cats, like stick figures and mailing them to people who are mining. Uh, in any way, somehow you have to incentivize uh, the miners, uh, no different than Bitcoin does. Well, the question is just uh, how much the infrastructure changes I mean, it, it does and it doesn't, right? So uh, the infrastructure for mining certainly marginally changes. Uh, the infrastructure for uh, other, other systems, uh, if you're, the, the infrastructure for other systems, say like a Coinbase or a BitPay kind of system, uh, doesn't change at all unless you want to uh, actively accept Bitcoin on a given side chain, right? On a given side chain, uh, you would need to also run whatever server software daemon for that side chain, the same way you would run a Bitcoin daemon uh, for Bitcoin. And you would also have to treat it like any other Bitcoin. So a transaction you receive on it, you'd have to treat the same way as you would see a, see a transaction on Bitcoin. Where are blockchains a bad idea? <laughs> well, doesn't actually right. Um, it is a terrible idea to put a blockchain in a blockchain that doesn't actually make sense for those who are wondering. Yeah. Um, yeah. So blockchains are generally a terrible idea for a lot of things. Uh, I'm not going to try to um, go into detail about like where they're all a terrible idea. Certainly there's been a lot of focus on like, well, we can do all of our computing in the world and we can replace AWS with a blockchain and it doesn't yeah. really work that way at all. It doesn't, that doesn't make sense. Uh, there's been a lot of like, well, we can just put the whole internet in a blockchain and then like all of the web pages are in a blockchain and they're always there and they're always accessible and you can see the whole history. And it's like, no, it doesn't scale, please. Like, blockchains do not scale very far. Uh, they scale wonderfully for like, yeah, I don't know if people were at the talk last night at the Bitcoin devs meetup, but there was a great talk on like how you take a, a Bitcoin-like system and build uh, trustless transactions on top of it without even having to put them in the chain. Um, and these kinds of systems are great. Like blockchains provide a very useful foundation and they don't scale very far beyond that. And they also don't, uh, it's, it's hard because there's so many people who like put out proposals that don't include a lot of this kind of incentive structures and they're just very insecure, right? It's, it's free to attack them and there's no cost to attack them. So like, why am I not attacking them for the lulls? I have better things to do, but there are other people who will as soon as they get big. So yeah, I, I know that didn't answer your question at all, but <laughs> if anyone has specific questions, I'd love to take them. <laughs> it wasn't clear from white paper uh, how you are going to freeze coins on the main chain while they are doing something on the side chain? Mm -hmm. um, so there's two models, right? There's the federated peg model, which uh, I believe was in an appendix, and it's kind of the stopgap model to the full uh, soft fork Bitcoin model of a side chain. Uh, and the federated model, uh, the freezing is just a simple transaction to send money to the federation. So it's a simple multi-sig transaction. It sends money to a multi-sig via P2SH or whatever. Um, 
and that multi-sig is the federation which is responsible for returning money uh, as it comes back from the sidechain. In the full uh, soft forked Bitcoin model, the way you freeze money is you send money to a specific uh, transaction output format. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar that all Bitcoin transaction outputs are programs, they're scripts. They're not just like a, here's a public key. No, it's actually a full program that says, uh, please provide a signature for this public key. Um, and that program, in this case, is one that says, if you provide a proof that the money was declared to be returned on the side chain, then you can spend this. Otherwise, this is just a lot. This is just a transaction, just okay. like anything else. Yeah, so, regarding federation, it means that some node should do a final signature to release the money, right? So yes. How it will be determined? Uh, so it, it's this is kind of a generic model for doing uh, like testing a software in Bitcoin, where if there's something that you want to do, uh, you can replace this execution of the script directly in the Bitcoin network with execution of the script by an oracle. And then you just send money to the oracle, and the oracle is, is responsible for executing the script the same way the Bitcoin network otherwise would, and then releasing the money if that script passes. Then the entire side chain will depend on a single oracle. Uh, a, an oracle or a group, in this case, it would be a group of people who are responsible. Uh, it means that you have to copy a private key to... No, you don't copy a private key. They each have their own private keys, and it's the same as a Bitcoin multi-signature thing, where it's like N of them. <coughs> so you'd have four out of, or five out of the seven of them have to agree to spend the money. Uh, yes, it's, it's obviously a very drastically reduced security model, and it's really just a uh, testing and kind of stop gap measure to like, hey, look, we can test this thing, we can show that it works, and then we can uh, upgrade to kind of the full security model. One more question. Okay. Uh, what's your opinion on the scalability debate? And if you could move the magic wand to scale Bitcoin, how would you do it? <laughs> wow, you're a dick. It's a terrible question. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> um, okay. Uh, the, so the scalability question of Bitcoin is really hard, right? Uh, Bitcoin, a blockchain system doesn't scale particularly far by itself. Uh, again, the talk last night was pretty, uh, pretty awesome. For those who missed it, I think it'll be online at some point. Uh, um, and people should watch that, where and there's a lot of ways where we can take Bitcoin and use it as a primitive and use it as a low-level tech and then build very scalable systems on top of it, which have drastically reduced trust from, say, the current financial system, but maybe marginally increased trust from Bitcoin itself, where Bitcoin is, I'm not trusting anyone except for miners, I'm trusting the miners. and. Uh, like, I'm putting this transaction and I'm not trusting anyone with it. And you can build some stuff on top of it where you're like, well, I'm not trusting you to steal my money, but maybe you can like lock up my money for a few days and I won't be able to get at it, but then I'll get it back. And you can build systems like this in Bitcoin that have drastically much huger scaling. Um, now, I don't want to say uh, I'm not going to speak for or against block size increases because that's a very complicated subject. Um, uh, but certainly, putting you know all of the transactions in the blockchain is never going to scale. Uh, you, the, the number of transactions in Bitcoin today that you see on exchanges and you see within Coinbase and you see with between Coinbase and BitPay and whatever else are already very very large and to some and potentially larger than a blockchain would ever scale to. Um, so we can't just like the increasing the block size is not a magic bullet. Uh, it, would have to be increased so drastically that the whole system would become a centralized system, and that's not okay, obviously. Um, so, sure, maybe block size needs to be increased, maybe it doesn't, maybe we need more room in the blocks, maybe we don't, I'm not gonna try to answer that, but uh, certainly we should be looking at building systems on top of Bitcoin that scale better than Bitcoin itself. Um, yeah. Cool, thank you. Yeah.